in June by Wiley. Uh, the book is organized into three Sorry. major parts, focusing on the tectonics, volcanics, and glacier features of Iceland. Okay, that's how this talk is now. Uh, again, my name is Dr. Tammy Jones. So uh, before we get started, a lot of people are interested as to how I ended up in Iceland in the first place. So my first trip to Iceland was in 2006, really when Iceland was off the map for most tourists. I convinced my big brother, Jim, to come along with me and we got the keys to Toyota Yaris. In the course of about 11 days, we circled the Ring Road, also called the Golden Circle Road. And, and in 2006, really, um, there wasn't GPS technology. We had a series of these paper roadmaps. And in June in Iceland, there's 22 hours of, of daylight. So it's really hard to navigate by the sun. So we found ourselves perpetually lost, but we were perpetually lost in this magnificent, magnificent island. They had amazing geology that would take me back nearly every single year thereafter. In 2014, I acquired a husband who has an amazing sense of direction. And so really starting in 2014, I was allowed to explore the interior of the island. And it really let me synthesize what the geology was in an advanced level. I initially went to Iceland in 2006 to set up a, a study abroad for Barry College undergraduate students. And so I taught a one-on-one -on -one class, but I also taught an advanced geological concepts class that let me focus on the tectonics, volcanics, and glacial features. So for doing that for more than a decade, I looked down in 2017 and I realized that I probably had enough information to write a book. And so my students are really the ones that inspired me uh, to get at it. And I, I love the writing process. I, I love the, the research aspect. Um, I loved all the light bulb moments I had when writing it and I really enjoyed the solitude. So I can't wait to write another, um, another book. Before we go into the presentation, there's something else that you need to know. And that is, I don't speak Icelandic. Although I practice with really good intentions um, it's a pretty complicated Nordic language. So I'm going to go ahead and apologize any, in advance for any mispronunciations, and there will probably be many. Uh, additionally, because this is a talk on the geology of Iceland, there's some acronyms that you need to become aware of. Uh, the first is MYO is millions of years old. MYA is millions of years ago. Modern time will be referred to as the common era historical time will be referred to as before common era. And the theme that you'll see on my figures and diagrams will be this yellow star that represents a hot spot or a mantle plume. So the next 25 minutes or so, I'm gonna take you on a journey to tell you about my favorite geological wonders of Iceland. Our story is going to begin with plate tectonics. So you may be aware that the earth is organized into these different geologic plates and that the earth is not static, but in fact, a dynamic space. So when we look at this modern plate tectonic diagram that you see on the right, you're gonna locate yourselves on the North American plate in Asheville. The North American plate is purple. And then to the right of the North American plate, you'll find the Eurasian plate. And what separates the North American plate from the Eurasian plate is something called a divergent plate boundary. So a divergent plate boundary is one that moves apart from one another and conveniently located on top of that divergent plate boundary is the island of Iceland. Iceland uh, has a rather unique story uh, uh, geologically and also relating to the position of where it is. So Iceland is 38 miles south of the Arctic Circle, and it's bordered by the cold waters of the Arctic Ocean to its north and the cold, dense, saline bottom waters of the Atlantic to its south. So the origins of Iceland only start at about 50 million years ago. And so when we consider the age of the Earth being 4.6 billion years, 50 million years is considered to be relatively recent time. When we look at this diagram over here on the right, you can locate the magma hotspot and it's located in yellow and you can look for it at 50 million years. So a magma hotspot is a body of magma that comes up from the outer core and it subsides just underneath the earth's surface. 
So the mantle plume itself stays stationary, but the plates move across it. So the diagram to the right is really showing you the pathway of where the hotspot has been over the past 50 million years to present. So if you look at zero, that represents modern day, and you can notice that the hotspot is directly under the island of Iceland. The mantle plume is about 200 miles in diameter, and that's pretty significant considering the size of this island. So at about 33 million years, what happened was the mantle plume got close enough to the ocean seafloor to be able to breach. And so when it did, it provided these layers and layers of basaltic magma that began to solidify. And it is that solidification that began to form the Icelandic plateau. What's interesting is that when we look at Iceland today, only 30% of the plateau is currently above sea level. So the remaining 70% is submerged underwater. Relating back to that hotspot, the hotspot itself is what we need to understand is that the hotspot itself has motion. So within the hotspot, they have these systems that are called convection cells and they're density driven systems. So you're imagining warm magma coming up and cooling at the surface and falling and condensing. So you get this motion within the body of this mantle plume. And it is the motion of those convection cells that acts as a driver for the plate tectonics on the island. Additionally, when we talk about a divergent plate boundary, what we need to realize is that you have plates that are spreading apart from one another and it allows that body of magma to work its way up to the surface relatively easy. So when we're looking at this diagram over here to the right, the pink represents the divergent plate boundary and we can look at the ages of the rocks relative to that. So those red bands are going to be only 2 million years old. And as we move away from the hotspot, they're gonna get consecutively older. So by the time we get to the edges of the coastline, the maximum age of the rocks exposed at modern day is only gonna be 13 million years old. And that's pretty exciting for a geologist because we're really looking at the current formation of an island right in front of our eyes. So we mentioned that there's a hotspot and we mentioned that that hotspot has energy and has motion. And that's acting as the driver to split the continent into two separate pieces. So when we look at the diagram, again, we can remember on the, on the first slide that we looked at, the North American plate was in purple on the left, the Eurasian plate was on orange on the right, and the red on this diagram represents that divergent plate boundary. So from the motion of the hotspot, what we recognize is that those two plates are moving apart from one another at one inch per year or 13 miles per million years. I'm gonna repeat that. So the plates are moving apart from one another at one inch per year or 13 miles per million years. So if you're interested in buying property on the island of Iceland, you should probably buy it along that divergent plate boundary because your property size is only gonna get bigger over time. You'll have to deal with earthquakes and volcanoes, but that comes secondary, right? So I'm hoping that you uh, have had a chance or will get a chance to, to visit Iceland. And if you do, um, you're gonna take a quick bus, bus ride out of Reykjavik and head east and go to a town called Thingvellir that's located on the this, on this star on this map. So Thingvellir is known to be the very first establishment of the Icelandic parliament in 874 CE. Uh, but to a geologist, uh, this is one of the greatest places in the world because it's an exposure of the divergent plate boundary. So at this national park called Thingvellir, you can stand on the Eurasian plate. You can look 13 miles across the valley to the North American plate. And 13 miles makes sense now, right? Because we've done the math to figure out the rate at which these plates are spreading apart. 
Um, when we talk about plate tectonics, sometimes we use the term horst and graben. The horst are the upper, upper uh, regions and the graben is often the basin. So you're imagining pulling something apart and the center is subsiding. And that's what you see here. So you see that the infill of water because it's becoming a basin as the plates move apart and the center graben gets lower and lower. I love visiting Bingville there because there's obvious signs of uh, plate tectonics. When you're walking through the mini trails, you can see brand new slumps of, of basalt that are sloughing off the, the sides of these horses. And so it gives you a real understanding that this island is dynamic and full of energy. And speaking of energy, that leads us into volcanoes. So you can't go to Iceland without talking about volcanoes. And that's because Iceland, that is the size of Virginia, has 33 active volcanoes during modern day. So that's your fun fact. That's your Jeopardy question. So I'm going to re repeat that. At modern day, there are 33 active volcanoes on Iceland, and it's only the size of Virginia. So anywhere you look, you're either going to see a modern volcano or you're going to see a remnant of a dormant volcano. When you look at the diagram here to the right, you can notice that those volcanoes are numbered one through 33. And a pattern should, should start to emerge. So you're looking at those 33 active volcanoes and they should outline the divergent plate boundary. When we talk about volcanoes in Iceland, we separate them into three major parts. So we talk about the northern volcanic zone, the eastern volcanic zone, and also the western volcanic zone. And historically, the biggest and baddest volcanoes in Iceland are in the eastern volcanic zone. So go ahead and take a look at that on your screen. So the biggest and baddest volcanoes are located along the southern coast of Iceland in the eastern uh, volcanic zone. And we're gonna highlight some of those for you in this talk. But before we do that, another fantastic thing about Iceland is that because there are so many volcanoes, it's one of the only places in the world where volcanologists can go and look at many different types of volcanic features in such a small place. So on the screen, I wanna talk about three of my very favorite uh, volcanic features. The first one, it's called a rootless cone, also known as a pseudo crater. And when you look at the picture, it might look like a volcano because it has flanks and it has a caldera, but instead of these, these features being formed by magma coming up from the subsurface, instead what happens is magma is flowing on top of the surface. And as that magma is flowing on top of the surface, it comes into contact with water. And that water might be a lake, it might be a swamp, it might be permafrost, but what happens is when the magma comes in contact with the water, you get this one-time steam eruption. So these volcanoes are dormant after the eruption because there's no longer a magma source to initiate volcanism. The picture on the screen is a rootless cone in Mivatn. Mivatn's up in the north. Um, but if you have the chance to go to the southern parts of Iceland, there is a place that's called Ruhuller, and there's 51 of these different craters. So it kind of feels like you're, you're on the moon. And these craters range in different sizes. But the cool thing is you can see exactly where the magma flowed on the surface because you can find them in a pattern that is represented of that past orientation. Next, we have columnar basalts. And these columnar basalts are truly a physics phenomenon. So here, what we're imagining is magma coming up from the subsurface, and it's gonna come in contact with water in the form of a lake or maybe uh, glacial ice. But in this instance, what happens is when that body of magma comes into contact with the water, you end up with contraction. So, the basalt, basalt is a type of igneous rock. When it begins to solidify, it contracts. So when we look down on top of column or basalt, you can see this perfect hexagonal shape that begins to form. And as that magma is coming up from the bottom, it forms these long 
and gigantic towers and columns of basalt. This picture was taken in, in the south again uh, at a place called Vic, and Vic is known as the Black Beach. Lastly, um, I want to talk to you a little bit about pillow basalts. Pillow basalts are really near and dear to me because they have climate change and I'm, I'm interested in researching that. Um, you may be familiar with the modern day formation of the pillow basalts if you followed the Hawaiian eruptions in 2018 and 2019. So how pillow basalts are formed is you have magma that's flowing down the flank of a volcano and this time that that body of magma is coming into contact with the ocean. And so different than columnar basalt that contracts when it comes into contact with the water, in this instance, the water is gonna cause the, the basalt to expand. And so you end up with these fantastic pillow-like features that you can see as you travel around the ring road. So again, these help to tell a geologist about the paleo, paleo means ancient, coastline. And of course, there's some fancy math that has to go into that because we have to calculate subsidence and uplift and erosion, but it gives us a first indicator of where the ancient sea level once was on the island. So because there's 33 active volcanoes, we've been able to study in the geologic record um, some pretty impressive eruptions. How do we do that? We use something that's called tephrochronology. So the study of tephrochronology is really the study of volcanic ash. So you're imagining a volcano that erupts. And of course, what we know is what comes goes up must come down. So all the ash that went up into the atmosphere slowly and gently will eventually fall to the surface. And that gets trapped in the geologic record. So we can look for major volcanic eruptions over geologic time to have an understanding of how often a volcano erupted. This is either called the recurrence interval or the repose of a, of a volcano. So when we're considering Iceland and we're considering these volcanoes, we're looking back again at the Eastern volcanic zone um, where 80% of, of all the eruptions on the island have taken place. Moreover, the recurrence interval tends to be between 20 and 25 eruptions per century. So if you're um, an Icelander and you've lived to the age of 100, you are going to have experienced about 25 different volcanic eruptions. So volcanic eruptions are pretty common to Icelanders. The majority of the volcanic eruptions are explosive, which means that they have great intensity when they erupt. I wanted to highlight three of my favorite volcanoes. Um, before I do that, we need to recognize that all volcanoes in Iceland are given female names. And that's for obvious reasons, because they're beautiful, they're complex, and they have the ability to change the world around them. So Hekla um, is my very favorite volcano on the island of Iceland. Um, it's one of my favorites because it's pretty remote to get to. So the people that go to visit her um, are really interested in, in volcanology and are pretty excitable to hike this volcano. Um, Hekla was quite a nuisance to the Vikings. So since 874 CE, when the Vikings uh, settled Iceland, he Hecla has erupted 18 different times. So you can imagine these, um, these Vikings trying to have dinner, Hecla erupts again and they're, they, oh no, now we have to go and, and shovel off this volcanic ash. But actually, um, Hecla has also been um, volcanically active recently. So Hecla erupted in 1970, 1980, 1990 and in 2000. So since 2000, Hecla has been dormant. So for the past 20 years, there hasn't been an eruption. And that's a big question mark for scientists to, to try to think about. 
Um, again, if you're living in the flanks of a volcano, in this picture, you can actually see a house. If you're living there, you actually want the volcano to erupt more often than not, because when a volcano goes into dormancy, it's storing energy. And so that's gonna lead to a much bigger and much more devastating eruption. The next is Katla. Um, Katla is also in the Eastern Volcanic Zone. It's much older than Hecla though. So Katla originates at about 10,000 years BCE. Uh, it was also quite a nuisance to the Vikings. But when we look at the Tefra chronology, we see a record of, of more than 300 different eruptions over its geologic history. Katla is known to be one of the biggest and baddest volcanoes, not only on the island of Iceland, but really globally. The last time Katla erupted was 1918. And we're gonna come back to talking about why it's been dormant for so long. Before we do that, we are going to look at its nearby neighbor called Ethelajokul. Uh, you might be familiar with Ethelajokul. That's totally say it, but that's how I'm saying it. Um, so Ethelajokul uh, last erupted March 10th, 2010. And you may remember this volcano because air traffic to and from Europe was essentially grounded. So it canceled 10,000 flights. It grounded 10 million passengers and it cost about $50 billion in gross domestic product. So this recent event that disrupted air tra travel and caused economic problems really gives us an idea as to why we need to study these natural disasters. So what I mentioned is that Fenla do Kool is the neighbor of Katla. And what's interesting is that when we look at the temporal chronology record, when one goes off, we see the other go off. And what I mentioned was the last time Katla erupted was 19. So Katla is more than a hundred years overdue for a volcanic eruption much larger volcano than Ethelaja Kool. I mentioned when we look at the Tefra chronology, her, these events associated with her, her eruptions are devastating. So if you talk to any volcanologist, when we talk about major volcanic eruptions that we uh, worry about, we look to Katla and wonder when the next time she will erupt. We talked about plate tectonics, we talked about tectonics, and now we're gonna talk about glaciers. This is one of my very favorite uh, pictures that I've taken in Iceland. Um, Vanten Jokul uh, uh, is uh, one of Europe's largest remaining glaciers, and its initial expanse occurred 2.7 million years ago to cover the entire island by 26,000 years. 26,000 years ago is also referred to as the last glacial maximum. So we can look at geologic records in North America, to expanse of the ice sheet at about the same time, also in other parts of, of Europe. At modern day, uh, Vatten Jokul only covers about 14% of the island or about 5,000 square miles. So what we need to recognize about glaciers is that they too are not static systems they're dynamic systems. So they're moving from high elevation to low elevation with energy. So they're gradient driven. And so what we're looking at here is this panoramic view of an outlet glacier. So you're imagining this glacial ice moving and carving the bedrock that's underneath it to create a valley underneath. And here's just a, a little, little video to help you appreciate the size and scope and the majesty of these glaciers. Um, the camera is flying up from the toe of the glacier up uh, to the top of the, of the ice sheet. Um, one of the things that was really interesting to me when I first started to go into Iceland in 2006, I had this preconceived idea of glaciers that they would be clean. Like I kind of expected them to be pristine and completely white. Um, but in fact, because they are picking up sediment, it becomes entrained within the glacial ice as it moves down slope. 
Additionally, because what we said was there's at least 25 volcanic events every century in Iceland, there's a whole lot of volcanic ash that gets incorporated into, into the ice sheet itself. So that's some of the remnants of what you're seeing in this little video. Um, Van Jokul is, um, is also hiding four volcanoes. So there's four volcanoes that are underneath the ice sheet. So if you were to take a plane and fly over, you would not be able to see these volcanoes. So your question might be, Dr. Giovanelli, what happens when a volcano erupts underneath an ice sheet? And I can tell you that it leads to a big disaster and a big flood. So these are termed joker loops. So what you're imagining is you have a volcano and on top of that volcano, you have a caldera and you have a, a magma chamber and that magma moves up the throat of that volcano. And as it does, it's giving off heat. So as it's giving off heat, it's melting the undersurface of the ice sheet. And so the caldera begins to fill up with that meltwater. And so it fills up and fills up and eventually the caldera will be breached and all the water that was present is going to flow down the flanks of the volcano in a massive flooding event. The last time this happened in Iceland was in 1990 in a volcano called Grimsvatn, also in the Eastern Volcanic Zone. And um, this flooding event produced a discharge of 180,000 cubic feet per second. And that, that flooding event had enough energy to tear down a bridge. And so that's what you're seeing in the, in the picture here to the right. 180,000 cubic feet per second of water flowing down the flanks of the volcano tears out part of the bridge of the ring road. Um, the good news is that these flooding events are pretty predictable. So when you have a caldera and you know its volume and then you can measure the rate at which that water is melting, then you're able to make some predictions about when you think a flooding event is gonna happen. And that's exactly what the scientists did here at Grimsvatn. They made a prediction, they evacuated, um, and as a result of that, no lives were lost. Catla, our biggest and baddest volcano that we're, we're watching for its next eruption, um, if we look at the temporal chronology for Catla in the modern record, we look to an event that happened in 1755 that's highlighted by the pathway in yellow on In 1755, this event, this flooding event, produced a discharge of, of 1 million cubic feet per second of water flowing down the flanks of this volcano. 1 million, 1 million cubic feet per second is equivalent to the discharge of the Amazon. So these events can be, can be obviously catastrophic and devastating and they can completely change a coastline. So I don't wanna end our talk talking about death and destruction. I wanna talk about something happy. So we are gonna conclude by talking a little bit about sustainable energy and of course, the Blue Lagoon, because all of you have seen pictures of the Blue Lagoon. Your mom's gone to the Blue Lagoon. Kim Kardashian has gone to the Blue Lagoon and you too can go to the Blue Lagoon for about $70. And when you pay that $70, you get to soak in geothermal wastewater for the entire day. Sounds a little bit less glamorous, doesn't it? So let's explain it. So um, Blue Lagoon is in the Rainies Peninsula. It's about two hours south of Reykjavik. And uh, the water that's heated up from that magma plume is really hot. And so it's too hot to transport for geothermal energy to Reykjavik. So what they have to do, build these retention ponds. So they're like holding ponds. So you pull up the water from the ground, you put it into the, the retention pond, AKA the Blue Lagoon, you let it cool it down and then you transport it to the major cities. Um, additionally, in the Rainies Peninsula, there's a whole lot of silica. Silica is a type of mineral. SiO2 is its mineral composition. 
um, silica, when it participates, it participates white. And so that's what you're seeing in this picture here. And so um, silica is corrosive and uh, it can clog the pipes. So they have to pull out the silica in this location before they transport the water. So silica is what is giving the blue lagoon that kind of like milky, uh, milky color. Um, the, the good news is that um, there is a whole lot of geothermal energy and that Iceland is 100% sustainable on renewables like that. So 13% of the island gets geothermal energy and the other remaining 87% is um, using hydroelectricity hydro from the meltwater off of the glaciers. And we're talking like very sustainable, small scale um, hydroelectric facilities. So we're not talking like grandiose Hoover Dam. And I think as we end our talk here, that's one of my favorite things um, about Iceland and about the culture is that they really are on a mission for conservation. They really appreciate the uh, resources that they have and they're very willing to take care of those. And so the hydroelectric facilities are, are, are very small and, um, and for the most part, do not damage the, the landscape. So I'm gonna conclude here. Um, I, of course, I always have to thank my, my wonderful husband because he's listened to um, me talk about Iceland pretty much every day for the past three years. I've had some fantastic contributions from Barry Collins. Um, my alma mater is University of Nebraska, one of them, and they've been a great supporter. Um, and of course, my publishers. So I'm gonna stop here and, and let you ask me some questions or comments or let's entertain some short stories. So I'm gonna go to the chat and Ellie has listed some of your questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and read those. Okay, so the first one is Charlotte asks, how does Iceland's geologic age compare to the oldest land pieces of the earth? Thank you for asking this question, Charlotte. So we say that the, the age of the earth is 4.6 billion years old, 4.6 billion years old. And so Iceland is, is relatively brand new compared to the oldest rocks that we find on the planet. And we find those oldest rocks um, in, in the Creighton. There's some exposures in Michigan. We find some in Australia, we find a few in Greenland, but, um, Iceland, the, the maximum age of Iceland is only about 33 million years old. So it's really young, geologically speaking. Okay, Molly asked, can you talk about how Iceland uses their geology to pursue new, new renewable energy like hydrothermal geothermal? Do you think their success is due to the geology or can those strategies be implemented? Um, okay, well, certainly, um, you have to have a hot spot in order to have geothermal energy. Um, so there's very few places in the United States where we could make that accessible. Um, you might know about the Yellowstone volcano and that's um, generated by a hot spot, um, but that's also not in a location that's very populated. So they have the opportunity to do geothermal energy, um, but uh, I think that it's not probably worth it for the population density that they're carrying currently. Um, um, and so about 13% of Iceland is using ge geothermal. It's a little bit tricky because you have to be close to the hotspot. So we said again that the majority of that heat is in the Eastern volcanic zone. The good news is that the majority of the major city, the capital city of Reykjavik is using geothermal heat. Um, there is a, a, about, 200,000 people that live in Reykjavik, and there's another 100,000 that live around the island. So Iceland has a very small population density of only about 300,000 people. Um, and so I think that's one of the reasons why they're able to be, to successfully harness geothermal energy, but also to use hydroelectricity without damaging the, um, the environment because they're putting up these very small and sustainable dams and not like these big mega structures. Good question. Okay. Go 
going into the chat here. Peter says, yeah, I bet it was amazing to see in person. It's, a, a, it's one of my very favorite places um, in the world to go. I mean, it's stunning. Um, the, the landscape is just breathtaking everywhere you look. And one of the best things about encompassing the island is that every single day is different. And, and maybe you wouldn't expect that, but like if you're, um, if you're starting in Reykjavik and you go counterclockwise around the island, you know, the first day you see um, these raw and jagged rocks and you're exploring the mid ocean ridge and the divergent plate boundary. The next day you're into um, these beautiful glacial rivers. The next day you're into the true um, outlet glaciers. And by the time you round the island, you start getting into this beautiful green landscape. Like, I don't know if you would ever guess it, but um, some of the water, the moisture coming off the Arctic Ocean just um, explodes the greenery um, along the northern uh, portions of, of the island. So, and of course there's volcanoes like everywhere you look. So uh, for me, that's so exciting to be able to, to see and just understand the different processes. Um, to me, that adds to the beauty. The more you understand about the landscape, it just really um, stirs emotion in me. Um, is Iceland basically all basalt? Ooh, good question, Peter. Um, so just composed of one rock type, I imagine that would affect the geology and ecology quite. So, um, so Peter, I'm, I'm glad you're thinking about this. This is a little bit more of an advanced uh, topic. So the, the answer is no. And, um, and actually, so when we talk about, um, about igneous rocks, we separate them into two different components. So we talk about those that are felsic and those that are mafic, and that has to do with the percentage of silica that's in each of these rock types. And so it would be expected that the island would be completely basalt, but that's not the case. Instead, we find pockets, and especially in the Eastern volcanic zone, there's these pockets of felsic magma. And so still, Peter, um, this is a pretty big controversy um, that's debated by volcanologists because the big question is where does all the silica come from? And so there's a lot of different um, camps in that. Some think it has to do with, um, remember the very first slide I showed you with the magma plume initially under Greenland? Some camps think that um, there was melting of continental crust that got mixed in with the mantle plume and that's where the source comes from. Um, some talk about crystallization patterns and like how quickly um, the magma is solidifying above and below the surface. So it is, um, I'm great, I'm, I'm so glad that you're thinking in that terms, it's a complicated situation. Are the cities all built far enough away from the 33 active volcanoes that even with a more violent eruption, they are safe. Um, um, no, no. Um, I can tell you that um, that people are more um, leery to build their homesteads in the eastern volcanic zone. Like they're a bit more cautious, especially like around Katla, Efinla, Jokul, Grimsbotten. Um, because we know that, well, we know that the Catla is gonna erupt sometime really, really soon. It's gonna be devastating. Um, but the challenge is that there's a whole lot of tourism that passes through the Southern coast. So it's kind of a trade off. If you talk to um, Icelanders and you mention like, hey, there's a volcano in your backyard, they are pretty, nonchalant about it like they're pretty casual about it so what I, they don't live in fear like they recognize that the volcano could go off at any time but it's not something that limits their lifestyle but i can tell you that um that they are disaster prepared so any homestead living close to a volcano is going to have all the things that you would need to hunker down right because a lot of times the ash is so thick like there's no way that you're gonna drive. Um, 
out of it. But the Icelandic Meteorological Society, they are the camp that, um, that puts in like the seismometers um, and the monitoring systems for these volcanoes. And I think that they do a really good job of keeping up with, um, with recognizing if there's gonna be a big event. So Iceland doesn't hesitate to put out an evacuation because they do want their populations to, to be safe. Charlotte asks, uh, what can Iceland's geology tell us about other divergent plate boundaries? Um, is this diverging plate boundary different from other divergent plate boundaries on Earth? So um, the relating back to that very first uh, slide where I showed you the modern plate tectonic diagram, the divergent plate boundary that we see in Iceland is a small portion of what we see around the entire globe. We also refer to divergent plate boundaries as mid-ocean ridges because it's what's spreading the bottom of our sea floors. So closer to home um, on the North American plate, we would talk about the mid-Atlantic ridge because it's, it's the divergent plate boundary that's spreading the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and it starts up at, at, at Iceland actually. So the divergent plate boundary is the longest mountain chain on the planet. It's longer than 3,000 uh, miles in length. And so um, for sure, that's one of the, the best things about Iceland is that we have data. So it's, it's currently being spreading and we can see those processes at the Earth's surface. So we use those to learn a whole lot about um, happening. Um, there's other similar divergent plate boundaries. So if we look at um, the East African Rift Valley um, in Africa, so East African Rift Valley is, um, is in th spreading through Tanzania. It's also called the Great Rift Valley. Um, so that is another example of a modern day uh, place where a divergent plate boundary is spreading land. Um, and then of course we can look at, um, at the Arabian Peninsula. So the Arabian Peninsula is being spread apart from Africa also by a, a divergent plate boundary. And so that's creating the Red Sea to become, become bigger. So um, sure, we can, we can look at real time um, the spreading of Iceland and we can for sure make relationships to other places that we see around the globe. Matthew asks, which volcano do you predict will erupt next and when? So again, we're looking back to, back to Katla. Um, Katla last erupted in 1918. It's uh, consistently had a 100 year recurrence in her. It's adjacent to Efin La Jokul that erupted in, in 2010. So that is the, that's the volcano to watch, certainly on, on Iceland. Um, and, and moreover, like, Again, we talked about Katla in the 1755 uh, flooding event that was caused by her. It is a, a massive and catastrophic volcano historically. And so that's where the, the big concern is. But you know, Matthew, um, we like to, to kind of like make, make predictions so we can plan a little bit uh, ahead. Obviously mother nature isn't necessarily on that schedule, which makes it um, tricky. And really at the end of the day, there's not a whole lot we can do ab about it. So, um, but it's, it's certainly interesting to, to think about. Okay, last one from me before we let you go. Um, what is your favorite field story? Um, my, favorite, my favorite field story in Iceland would have, nobody's ever asked me this question before. Um, well, I can, I can tell you um, one, of my, one of my favorite, very favorite things uh, to do is, is looking at these major, major volcanoes. And um, what's so interesting is that when you're around a volcano, there's always these geothermal hotspots. And so you could be hiking along and it can be miserable and raining and cold. And all of a sudden you have this like oasis of like heat that you can like, um, you can warm up by. So that's probably one of my very favorite being in the field. Um, 
in Iceland. All right, Abigail, have we rounded out our hour? So she said, thank you, Dr. Tammy, you're amazing. <laughs> thank you so much for sticking out with us through our technical issues, you're so cool. Well, thank you everybody, I had a great time. Um, if you have other uh, questions, comments, please feel free just to look me up. Um, my author website is geologyoficeland.com. Um, and if you are um, a high school teacher, middle school teacher, elementary school teacher, I would love to um, talk to your class. If you So go ahead and invite me if, if you want to. Have a great day in Asheville, everybody. Thank you.